In this video, you'll be looking at how to interpret and predict infrared spectra, particularly in the context of A2 chemistry, looking at uh, the functional groups that we've encountered, for example, those in carboxylic acids and alcohol molecules. So here are the learning outcomes for this video. First of all, we'll revise the idea that uh, specific frequencies of infrared radiation are able to make particular bonds in molecules vibrate with greater energy, an idea familiar from AS. We'll then look at how we can use information from the data sheet to interpret infrared spectra, particularly in terms of these familiar functional groups we've been looking at in the Watson and Medicine unit. And finally, we'll look at how we can predict the infrared spectra of molecule containing these particular functional groups. Okay, first of all, just a brief bit of background about infrared radiation. Infrared radiation has a longer wavelength than visible light or a lower frequency than visible light. It's clearly invisible to our eyes. However, it does interact with many of the molecules that uh, living systems contain, particularly water, uh, but also molecules that contain any covalent bonds are potentially able to absorb infrared radiation, as we will see. Okay, let's think then about what we mean when we talk about the vibration of bonds. Here's a very simple molecule, hydrogen iodide. We can think of it as two atoms connected by a single covalent bond, and that single covalent bond acts a little bit like a spring. So you can imagine the spring lengthening and shortening, and we talk about that as being the vibration of the bond. That happens many million millions of times a second, and that represents the frequency of the bond. Key thing to remember is that different bonds vibrate at different frequencies. What then are the factors that affect the frequency of vibration of a bond? Well, first is the strength of a bond. The stronger a bond is, the higher the frequency at which it tends to vibrate. So double bonds will tend to vibrate, for example, at a higher frequency than single bonds. Also depends on the mass of the atoms. So for example, if you have heavy atoms, they will tend to vibrate at lower frequencies than bonds that are connected uh, lighter atoms. So for example, bonds to hydrogen atoms, like the one here, tend to have relatively high frequencies compared, for example, to a bond between two iodine atoms. And just to indicate that, here's uh, a comparison of the frequencies at which various bonds in hydrogen halides vibrate. Notice that this number here is not described as frequency. This is actually what we call the wave number. It's the number of of infrared wavelengths that fit into one centimetre, but it happens to be proportional to the frequency of vibration of the infrared radiation. And so you'll see that hydrogen chloride absorbs infrared radiation and hence vibrates at a higher frequency than hydrogen iodide. Why should that be? Well, it's to largely to do with the increased bond enthalpy. Even though a chlorine atom is lighter than a hydrogen atom, the higher bond enthalpy means that you get a slightly higher frequency for the bond absorbing. OK, we'll just have a look at the idea that the vibration of bonds can actually happen in a number of different ways. We've talked about the stretching of bonds, and you can see here that some of these bonds are indeed stretching. Others are kind of waggling or bending. In reality, a given molecule, in this case methane, can vibrate in a whole variety of different ways. And that's why you sometimes see uh, quite a complicated pattern of infrared absorption frequencies, even for a relatively simple molecule, as we will see. So we'll have a look now at what, at what a typical infrared spectrum looks like. So we'll hopefully be familiar with this from our work at AS. We have two axes here, the first of which is wave number. So this represents, as we said before, the number of complete wavelengths of infrared radiation 
that can fit into one centimeter. It's proportional to the frequency of the infrared radiation, um, but it's used because it has a much more convenient size than the values for the frequencies of radiation. You'll notice that the y-axis is labeled transmittance. In other words, over the vast range of the wavelength we're considering here, this molecule butane allows infrared radiation to pass through completely. 100% is transmitted and none is absorbed. It's only at a certain fixed number, uh, fixed wave, wave number, that we get a big drop in transmittance, and that drop is described as a peak, even though, of course, it looks much more like a trough to you. There are also some smaller peaks over here. So we can actually use the wave number at which that peak occurs, and we can describe it fairly precisely uh, by looking on the x-axis here. So here we've got peaks at these particular wave numbers. Very important when you're describing peaks that you include the unit of wave numbers, centimeters to the minus one. Okay, we'll have a look now at the information that you'll be using in an exam, and that will be your data sheet. Your data sheet has a table looking something like this. It could be useful at this stage for you to find your data sheet and to locate this table in it. So you might like to stop the video while you do that. The most important thing to realize about this data sheet is that it provides information about the frequencies or wave numbers at which different bonds will absorb infrared radiation. Notice that the bonds can be found in a variety of different locations or effectively functional groups. Those locations can make a slight difference to the wave number. However, a word of warning, uh, in reality, these wave number ranges are only a guide and it's certainly possible to find bonds absorbing slightly outside that range. So don't take this as an absolute uh, guaranteed guide to where you will find particular bonds absorbing. So we're given information about the bond, the location and the wave number and you should aim to include reference to all that information when you are discussing an infrared spectrum. Just a couple of other points about this table. The carbon-hydrogen bonds that we see listed here, these are wave numbers for the carbon-hydrogen bonds stretching in the way we saw earlier. It's also true that carbon-hydrogen bonds can bend. We saw that in the methane molecule. And those bending vibrations occur at about 1,400 wave numbers or centimeters to the minus one, right in the middle of what we call the fingerprint region, which is one reason why the fingerprint region is such a complicated region. The other thing to notice is that this arene location here, the bond is given using the benzene structure there. So what you're really picking up is delocalized carbon-carbon double bonds. So if you want to discuss the bond that is actually absorbing in this region here, 1450 to 1650, it's really the delocalized carbon-carbon double bond. A couple more points to notice. First of all, you will spot that carbon-carbon single bonds do not occur in this table. The reason for that is that they are nonpolar bonds and nonpolar bonds are unable to absorb infrared radiation. Even carbon-carbon double bonds and carbon-carbon triple bonds are relatively nonpolar as well. And you'll see that those bonds are described as having only medium intensity in the right-hand column here. Uh, so they can be quite weak features. It's very hard to predict whether or not a given bond is going to be a strong absorption with a, a deep trough, deep peak, or a much weaker feature, but this gives you some indication here. One thing to notice, particularly for OH groups, is the fact that the peaks tend to be very broad, and that is due to the presence of hydrogen bonding. And this asterisk here reminds you that alcohols and carboxylic acids uh, tend to be hydrogen bonded in reality, and therefore will have that broad spectrum. So we'll just summarize now some of that. There's the idea that uh, infrared absorption 
and doesn't tend to worry too much about the bending frequencies and therefore we have this fingerprint region below about 1400 wave numbers which is very hard to interpret. We can't detect carbon-carbon bonds and these ranges are only quite approximate. Uh, for example, they're often affected by the presence of things like benzene rings uh, and we can get broad peaks if you've got hydrogen bonding present. So we look now at a slightly more complicated spectrum than the one that we saw earlier on. So here we've got several regions in which there's absorption happening. You can see here we've got a broad peak and then some much sharper peaks here. And we would certainly need to interpret those peaks. Down here, this is what we will call the fingerprint region. Very, very hard to interpret these peaks below about 15 or 1400. So we tend not to worry about that. Uh, and that's important for you to realize. OK, so let's see what you would do if you were interpreting a spectrum. So here we have a spectrum. Uh, we're going to only focus on peaks above around about 1600 wave numbers. So there's one here, one here, and in fact one here as well. So around 3000 wave numbers, there's two separate peaks. It can be sometimes quite hard to spot those. So there's three peaks we need to identify. Uh, you can see here that the bonds have already been included on the spectrum for you. You will need to include information about not just the bond, but also the location. So if we actually look on our infrared uh, table in our data sheet, um, the lower peak here at about 2950 is a carbon-hydrogen bond in an alkane. The upper peak here above 3000 wave numbers is a carbon-hydrogen bond in an alkene. And that alkene functional group also crops up here because here's the carbon-carbon double bond. So that's the kind of information you'll want to include in any discussion of the infrared spectrum. Having discussed the spectrum, you're often then asked to relate the spectrum to the structure. So you'll have your information about the bonds that you think are present and the functional groups present, and you'll then be asked to use information provided in the question to figure out the structure of the molecule. For example, you may be told that it contains four carbon atoms, in which case you might well suggest that the molecule might look something like this, containing a carbon-carbon double bond, and giving you, therefore, the characteristic frequencies at 3050 and 1650. Obviously, there are possible isomers of that that might exist as well. And that does illustrate one of the limitations in the use of infrared spectroscopy, that you can only get approximate information about the structure, the exact structure. OK, so you should now be able to look at a spectrum like this. We're told it's propanone. We've already indicated what the bonds are that give rise to each of these peaks here. Can you draw out a table identifying what information we can deduce about those peaks? Pause the video while you do. So here's what your table should look like. So you give information about the actual wave number of the peak. You identify the bond that gives rise to that peak. And you give information about the location does illustrate an important point about infrared spectra, that there are two useful ranges where you should be looking. One is here around 3,000 wave numbers, where we expect to see bonds to hydrogen atoms, like oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, hydrogen, and carbon hydrogen. The second is around here at about 16 to 1750 wave numbers, where we expect to see double bonds between carbons or carbon and oxygen. Very rarely you may detect the triple bonds here. And as we know, the fingerprint region is not really going to be very helpful to us, although, of course, in reality, it's used by uh, chemists in research because they will use the exact pattern of fingerprint peaks to identify the molecule from a computer database. So now let's look at a, a real spectrum. Um, so here we have quite a complicated spectrum, focusing on the region just around about 3,000 wave numbers and from about 1,600 upwards. Can you attempt to write down a table showing you what you can deduce about this molecule? So pause the video while you do that. And here's the kind of table that you would come up with. So here are the peaks that we are looking at. Here are the bonds that, that cause those peaks. And look, here's the location of those peaks. And here's how you would write down an interpretation of that in an exam answer. Always specify the wave number, bond, and location.